Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you have never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about the solved case of a double murderer, an evil individual who took the lives of two young teenage girls back in the 1980s. This case marked a huge turning point for forensic investigations because it turns out that this killer was the first person in the UK to be convicted of murder using DNA profiling. So it's a really, really interesting case. But equally, it is an incredibly frustrating one too because despite the horrific crimes that this person committed, he was actually released from prison. And we'll obviously talk more about that later on in the video. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a massive thank you to Audible for kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment and audiobooks. I've been using their service for such a long time now and I cannot rave about them enough. They offer a huge selection of audiobooks in their collection across every genre. They they have bestsellers, they have new releases, celebrity memoirs, and also my personal favourite genre, mysteries and thrillers. But in addition to all of that, they also have podcasts, they offer guided wellness programmes, comedies, originals, there is something for everyone to enjoy on Audible. Audible members are given one credit every single month, which can be used to purchase any title from the entire catalogue, regardless of the price, and then that title is yours to keep. And the Audible app makes it super, super easy to listen at any time, anywhere. So for example, I use the app to listen to my audiobooks whilst I'm cooking. Sometimes I even listen whilst I'm just relaxing in the bath. The Audible title that I purchased this month was this one, Inside Broadmoor, Up Close and Personal with Britain's Most Dangerous Killers by Jonathan Levi and Emma French. I've talked about a few killers that have been to Broadmoor on my channel before, such as Robert Knapper, Kenneth Erskine, the Stockwell Strangler. Broadmoor has contained many of the UK's most dangerous and violent individuals, and this audiobook has been on my list to listen to for a while now, and it is so incredibly interesting. It gives you a bit more of an insight into what life was actually like in there, so I highly recommend. So if you would like to give Audible a go yourself, then you can go to audible.com forward slash molly, or you can text molly to 500 500 to start your free 30-day trial. Again, that's audible.com forward slash molly, or text molly to 500 500 to start your free 30-day trial. Thank you so much to Audible once again for sponsoring sponsoring this video and supporting the channel. Thank you to you guys for always supporting the sponsors on this channel. And now let's just get into the case. So for this week's case, we are going back just under four decades to the year 1983 in the county of Leicestershire in the East Midlands of England. Specifically, this case begins in a village called Narbra in Leicestershire with a young girl named Linda Mann. Linda Mann was 15 years old when this case happened. She was born in 1968. Her parents were called Kath and Eddie and she was one of three children. She had two sisters named Susan and Rebecca and Linda was the middle child. From what I can gather, Linda had a very normal childhood for the time. She had a good childhood. She was described as being very bright, very hardworking. She did well in school. She had a lot of friends. She was bubbly, but also she could be quite quiet and shy at times. Her mum, Kath, said that she loved music. She loved to dance. All in all, she was just a very nice, happy young girl. Linda was really, really good with children. She loved Love spending time with young kids and so for that reason she used to do a lot of babysitting. She babysat for many of the parents in the local area and that is exactly what she had been doing on the evening of the 21st of November 1983. That night she went to a house in the area to babysit a couple of children. She was there for a few hours and then she left to walk back to her home and she walked along a route that she had taken many many times before 
before and knew very well. However, on this particular night, she never actually made it back home. On this particular night, Linda Mann disappeared. And this was not like Linda. It was not at all in her character to do something like this, to just not come back home and not get in contact with her family. And so they panicked and at around 11 p.m. they got in contact with the police and they reported Linda as missing. As soon as the police received this report, officers were sent out to look for Linda alongside Linda's family. They also went out, they started looking around. They were shouting Linda's name, but they had no luck. And of course, by this time, it was very late at night. It was completely dark outside and that made it really, really difficult to search for her. So the search continued the next morning and now that it was light outside, it wasn't long before they found Linda. But unfortunately, when they did find her, she was no longer alive. Linda's dead body was discovered that morning by a member of the public who was cycling to work. She was found hidden behind a bush in a field next to an area called the Black Pad in Narborough. The Black Pad was kind of like a footpath or an alleyway that Linda had walked down numerous times. It would have been the quickest way for her to get home after she was babysitting the previous night. But at some point while she was walking along the Black Pad alleyway that evening, she was attacked and following the discovery of her body, her family received the heartbreaking news that she was dead. 15 year old Linda Mann had been murdered that night. It was found that she had been strangled to death and also raped by her killer and then they just left the scene and left her body out in the cold. So what was originally a missing persons inquiry had very, very quickly turned into a murder investigation. Now, instead of searching for Linda, the police were searching for the evil monster that did this to her. Now, unfortunately, because Linda had been attacked and killed late at night in a very quiet and secluded area, the police didn't really receive any tips and leads in terms of witnesses. No one had witnessed the murder. So they didn't really have any lines of inquiry to go down in that aspect. But what they did have right from the beginning was DNA evidence of the offender. Traces of the killer's semen were collected from Linda's body from where she had been raped. Now, of course, at this time in 1983, DNA and forensic technology was in its infancy and was very, very basic. It was nowhere near as good and as advanced as it is today. And so for that reason, all these semen samples could tell the police at this point was that the killer's blood group was group A, which at the time belonged to roughly 10% of the male population. And they were also able to tell that they were a PGM1 secretor. A secretor is a person who secretes blood into bodily fluids such as saliva and semen. That was literally all they knew. All the police knew about this killer was his blood group and the fact that he was a PGM1 secretor. So the investigation continued and one of the main theories that the police had in the very, very beginning was that the killer was probably a local. It was someone that lived nearby. Just the way in which Linda's murder was carried out, where it was carried out, made the police think that the person who did this was familiar with the village. They knew where they could commit a murder at night and not be seen or heard along an unlit alleyway next to a field. And as I'm sure you can understand, this theory absolutely terrified people. The thought that the murderer was someone that was just walking the streets, that lived locally terrified the entire community. There was a killer amongst them and no one had any clue who it was and any clue whether or not they were going to strike again. And the police were very aware that this fear that the entire community had just put even more pressure on them to catch this guy. However, they were really struggling. They were working so hard and following up on every line of inquiry, but nothing was bringing them any clue closer to identifying the perpetrator. And as a result of this, the case of Linda Mann eventually started to go quiet and go cold. And then just under three years after Linda's murder, it seemed as though the Leicestershire police had another very, very similar crime on their hands when a second young woman disappeared. This young woman was named Dawn Ashworth. She was also 15 years old and she was born in the early 
early 1970s. Dawn's parents were Robin and Barbara Ashworth and Dawn had a younger brother. His name was Andrew. Sources describe Dawn as being a very likeable young girl who was very mature for her age, very sensible. She had a part-time job at a local newsagent shop in Enderby, which is a village in Leicestershire. It's the same village where Dawn lived with her family and it's very close to Narborough where Linda Mann lived. It's about a mile away. Dawn was apparently very creative. She liked to draw and paint. She liked clothes and music. She was just a typical teenage girl growing up in the 80s. On the afternoon of the 31st of July 1986, Dawn left her house and she went to Narborough because she had arranged to go and see some of her friends there that day. However, Dawn never returned home later that evening. She was due to be back at a certain time. She had a curfew, but she just didn't come back. At some point during her walk home, she just disappeared. And so it wasn't long before her parents got in contact with the police and reported her as missing. Immediately, a search for Dawn Ashworth began and just two days, after she was last seen alive her dead body was found. Dawn had been murdered. Dawn was found by a dog handler in a field next to an area called Ten Pound Lane, which is the footpath, the route that she would have taken on the day that she disappeared. And Ten Pound Lane is actually less than a mile away from the Black Pad alleyway where Linda Mann was attacked. Dawn was discovered in a field amongst a load of stinging nettles and she was underneath a log, apparently. Her attacker put a big heavy log on top of her to obviously try and hide her body. Dawn's cause of death was found to have been strangulation and she too had been raped by her killer. And as soon as the police found Dawn's body and they confirmed that she had been murdered, they instantly started thinking that her case was probably linked to Linda Mann's. I mean, there were just so many similarities. They were both young teenage girls, both 15 years old. They had both been attacked whilst they were walking on their own along a remote quiet footpath where no one else was really around. As I mentioned their bodies were found less than a mile away from each other and they had both been raped and strangled to death. These similarities immediately indicated that they were killed by the same man. Whoever killed Linda also killed Dawn just under three years later. So of course this just hugely added to everyone's fears. The terror that everyone felt when Linda was killed just instantly doubled because now two young girls had been taken. Other young women were especially terrified. They were the most scared because clearly that's who this killer was targeting and these murders were obviously sexually motivated. Due to the fact that Dawn was raped, scientists were able to obtain the killer's semen from her body but again as I said earlier there wasn't too much that they could really do with this evidence at the time in the 80s. It was very useful evidence to have for the future of the investigation but at this point in time it didn't provide them with the breakthrough that they instantly needed. Although it wasn't too long after Dawn's murder when the police identified a possible person of interest in the case. It was a man named Richard Buckland. He was just a few years older than Linda and Dawn. He was around 17 years old. According to reports, he apparently had some learning difficulties and he lived and worked locally. He worked in a kitchen at a hospital nearby. And the reason he became a person of interest in this case was because he seemed to be very, very interested in the murder investigation. I think he was seen on a couple of occasions just hanging around near the area where Dawn Ashworth's body was found. And also he would pop by the mobile incident room quite often where the detectives and the police were working on this case. Richard Buckland would literally just turn up at the mobile incident room and ask the police what was going on with the investigation. Were the police any closer to finding the killer? And he was someone that was kind of known to the police prior to this. Apparently he had been arrested and convicted for a couple of different crimes, including sexual offences, I believe. So for that reason, and the fact that he seemed very, very interested in the case, he did become 
a suspect in the murder inquiry, detectives started to think that maybe the reason he seemed quite invested in the investigation was because he was the killer and he wanted to determine whether or not they were close to identifying him. So because of their suspicions, the police brought Richard Buckland in for a questioning and he was asked what he'd been doing on the day that Dawn Ashworth was killed. But apparently he couldn't really give much of an explanation his account, whatever it was, clearly had a lot of holes in it, a lot of inconsistencies because the police couldn't rule him out and so he was arrested in August of 1986 and he was kept in custody and very surprisingly it wasn't long until he dropped a huge bombshell on the police. He actually confessed. Richard Buckland confessed that he was the person who killed Dawn Ashworth. He was the murderer that they had been looking for. However, when the police asked him about the murder of Linda Mann, which happened a couple of years earlier, he said that he had nothing to do with that. He denied her murder, which really confused the police. I think it kind of had them in two minds because on the one hand, he would have only been around like 14 years old at the time of Linda's murder. And the way in which it was carried out made it seem as though the crime was committed by someone older, an adult man. But then on the other hand, Richard had confessed to Dawn's murder. And like we've talked about, detectives were pretty certain that the person who killed killed Dawn also killed Linda. There were just way too many similarities to not think that. So they were kind of torn on whether or not to believe him on that. Was he really responsible for just the one murder or did he in fact commit them both? But then why would he admit to one and not the other? It doesn't really make much sense. Regardless, Buckland was ultimately charged with both murders not long after his arrest. However, the case wasn't over yet, although they had his kind of semi-confession, they needed more evidence to prove that he was the one who did it, just in case the case went to trial. They wanted to obtain some DNA evidence that linked Buckland to the crime, and so the detectives reached out to a scientist named Alec Jeffries, who at the time was doing some work and research into genetic fingerprinting and DNA analysis. And at this point, remember it was only 1986, so this was a whole new thing and the detectives working on this case wanted to find out if maybe Alec Jeffries could help them with their investigation and Alec Jeffries agreed he wanted to help and so he got to work on trying to prove through DNA analysis that Richard Buckland was the killer. Now it was found that Richard Buckland's blood type was group A and I believe he was also a PGM1 secretor just like the killer. So the police felt like they were on the right track. Now, when Alec Jeffries compared the DNA, the traces of semen found on Dawn Ashworth's body to the semen found on Linda Mann's body, it was found that they were a match. So that confirmed what the police had suspected all along. These two young girls were indeed raped and murdered by the same person. However, following this, it was found that that person was in fact not Richard Buckland. His DNA profile did not match that of the killers. Richard Buckland was innocent. He'd previously given a false confession for some reason and this completely shocked the police. By this point they had spent quite a few months working on their case against him. They were so sure that he was the murderer but he wasn't. So all that time they spent focused on him had been wasted. The real killer was still out there somewhere. Following this massive setback in the investigation, without really any other suspects or lines of inquiry to go down, detectives decided to conduct a mass DNA screening. They were going to ask every single male between the ages of 18 to 34 that lived in the Leicestershire villages of Enderby, Narborough, and also 
also another village called Little Thor to come forward and provide the police with a blood sample which could then be tested and compared to the DNA of the killer because as I mentioned earlier the police were so certain that the killer was a local the killer lived in one of these three villages and this was actually the very first murder case in UK history where a mass DNA screening was conducted this kind of thing had never been done before but the police were desperately hoping that it would provide them with the breakthrough that they so desperately needed it was more of a process of elimination I think obviously they were not expecting the killer to come forward and volunteer his DNA but at least this way they could rule innocent men out of the inquiry and those that were not willing to give a DNA sample could be looked at a little bit more so the mass DNA screening began all men in the three Leicestershire villages were sent a letter in which they were invited to come down and provide a blood sample and thousands of men responded to this and they turned up to give their DNA all of their blood samples were then tested and compared to the killer's DNA profile but to no avail, there was no match. The mass DNA screening continued, but they never got a hit. There was never a match. But then in early August of 1987, so just over a year after the murder of Dawn Ashworth, there was an absolutely huge development in this case, which came after a woman reported to the police a conversation that she had recently overheard, a very worrying conversation. This woman was in a local pub in Leicestershire when she overheard a man talking to someone else in the pub and he was talking about how he had taken the blood DNA test for the murder inquiry for someone else. So he had gone to give his DNA but when he went he gave another man's name and when this woman overheard this, she thought that it was incredibly strange because why would someone do that? Why would someone take the test for someone else unless the person they were taking it for had something to hide? So because of her concerns, this woman immediately contacted the police to report what she had heard and the police were able to track down the man that said he had taken the test for someone else. This man's name was Ian Kelly and he was brought into the police station to be questioned about the conversation in the pub and instantly Ian Kelly admitted that it was true he had taken the test for another person. He'd taken it for a man named Colin Pitchfork. Colin Pitchfork was around 27 years old at this point and he he was Ian Kelly's co-worker. They worked together at a bakery in Leicestershire and Ian said that one day Colin pulled him aside at work and he asked him if he would be willing to take the DNA test for the double murder inquiry in his name and his reason for this he told Ian was that he couldn't do the test because he had already done it for another friend of his. One of his friends asked him to do the test in his name because he was worried about doing it. I believe because he had a criminal record of some sort and he didn't want the police to harass him and so Colin agreed to do it for him but then Colin received his letter in the mail asking him to do the test and obviously he couldn't take the test twice so he asked Ian Kelly if he would do it for him just like he did it for his friend and eventually Ian Kelly was persuaded and he agreed. Colin Pitchfork paid Ian Kelly a couple of hundred pounds, he changed the photo in his passport to a photo of Ian Kelly because the men had to take um, some form of ID with them when they went to give their DNA. Ian Kelly went and he did the test in Pitchfork's name and that was the end of it or so it seemed. It wasn't long after this when Ian was overheard in the pub and the woman who heard him got in contact with the police. So following all of this, after they spoke to Ian Kelly, the police knew that they had to immediately apprehend this Colin Pitchfork and actually get a DNA sample from him to see if it was a match, to see if the real reason he didn't want to take the test himself was because he was the killer. So they found out his Address, and in September of 1987 they went to his home in the village of Littlethorpe in Leicestershire and there they arrested him and took him to the police station and unbelievably before his DNA was even taken 
he confessed. He immediately confessed to the murders of 15-year-old Linda Mann and 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth. And unlike the previous suspect, Richard Buckland, the confession that Colin Pitchfork gave was not a false one because when his DNA was taken and it was compared to that of the killers, it was an exact match he was the double murderer that the police had been looking for and he clearly knew that this day would come eventually he was not going to be able to hide forever one day the police were going to catch up to him and he knew that when they did his dna would be matched to the killers so he didn't even bother trying to deny it he just straight up said yep it was me but before we go any further with the actual case let's go through the background of this killer talk about his upbringing and just his life leading up to this point. So Colin Pitchfork was born on the 23rd of March 1960 and he was born and raised in Leicestershire. He grew up in a village called Newbold Verdon. Now I couldn't find the names of Colin's parents but I know that he was one of three children. He had an older sister and a little brother. Apparently growing up Colin always felt like he was the odd one out. I don't think he ever really felt like he fit in with his family for some reason but apart from that it seems as though he had a very normal childhood he seemed to be a very normal young boy he took part in different clubs such as the boy scouts he attended the market bosworth high school and then following this he went on to go to college he was just like any other young man from what we know there was nothing that happened in his childhood that could have indicated what he would go on to do later in his life which i think is partly what makes this case so interesting because normally when we talk about a killer's background there's something there that isn't quite right isn't normal behavior so for example there's a history of abuse in the family a lot of killers experience abuse growing up some killers start committing smaller crimes such as petty theft at a young age some have a history of violence and start hurting and torturing animals but colin pitchfork didn't really have any of that in his his background that we know of anyway. There was nothing in his background to indicate that he would have been capable of raping and murdering two teenage girls but the evidence proved that he very much was. In his teenage years after Pitchfork left college, he decided to do an apprenticeship at a bakery called the Hampshire's Bakery in Leicester. And I don't believe he ever left this bakery. This is the same bakery that he worked in alongside Ian Kelly at the time of his arrest. He eventually got married in 1981. He married a woman that he met in 1979 and they actually met whilst he was doing some volunteer work for a children's charity which just side note how insane is that this man did volunteering for a children's charity and then later in his life he would go on to rape and kill two teenage girls two children i literally cannot wrap my head around that it's terrifying colin and his wife eventually moved to little thorpe in leicestershire they had two children together two sons one of which was born in 1983 and the other in 1986 coincidentally the same years that he committed his murders and he was not a good husband to his wife at all he was not a faithful husband he would cheat on her he actually had an affair with another woman whilst his wife was pregnant with their first baby and as well as this pitchfork also started exposing himself to women he would just take his clothes off and flash young women whilst he just walked past them on the street and he was actually arrested for this in the spring of 1983 just months before the murder of linda mann he was arrested for indecent exposure i don't believe he really received any punishment for this like he wasn't sent to prison or anything like that from what i can gather he was just referred to a psychiatric counsellor but it kind of blows my mind that he was arrested for indecent exposure the same year that linda mann was killed and yet he wasn't on the police's radar they didn't look into him as a possible person of interest in her case even though he had been arrested earlier that year for a sexual offence and clearly his indecent exposure offence was not taken seriously enough at the time he was just referred 
for counselling and sent on his way, free to do it again, free to do even worse, which is exactly what he did. So going back to where we were in the case, as we know, Pitchfork was arrested in September of 1987 after his co-worker Ian Kelly admitted that he had taken the DNA test in Colin's name. Just wanted to quickly mention what happened with Ian Kelly for a second before I carry on with Colin. Now, Ian was charged with perverting the course of justice for what he did. Obviously, it's not believed that he knew that Colin was the killer and that that's why Colin wanted him to take the DNA test for him, but it doesn't change the fact that it was wrong of him to do that. Whether he knew that Colin was the killer or not, he should have never have agreed to do that. And so Ian Kelly was arrested and he was charged and convicted for his part and he was given an 18-month suspended sentence. Like we've talked about, when Colin was arrested, Arrested, he confessed to the crimes immediately and his DNA was found to be a match to the traces of semen that were found on the bodies of Linda and Dawn. Following his arrest, he was charged with both the rape and murder of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth. He also had another charge relating to an assault that he committed in 1985 and I believe he was also charged in relation to the whole situation with Ian Kelly, conspiracy to pervert the course of justice. And when it came to his plea hearing, he pleaded guilty to his charges, which meant that there didn't have to be a trial. However, during his court proceedings, the way in which his murders were carried out was revealed. Chillingly, it was actually found that on the evening of Linda Mann's murder, the 21st of November 1983, 23-year-old Colin Pitchfork was driving around in his car with his first son in the back who at this point was just a baby he was about three months old he was driving around in his car trying to get the baby to go to sleep and that was when he spotted 15 year old Linda Mann he saw her walking towards the black pad alleyway on her own in the dark and so he got out of his car he left the baby in there and then he approached Linda some sources state that he flashed at Linda and then he forced her into the nearby field there he demanded that she remove her clothing and then he proceeded to rape and strangle her and then he left her body he went back to to his car where he had left his three month old baby and he just went home. Now it actually turns out that the police did go to Colin Pitchfork's house following the murder of Linda Mann and he was asked where he was on the night of her murder but this was just part of their door-to-door -door inquiries at the time. They were going to the home of every man in the area asking for information about their whereabouts that night and at the time the officer who interviewed him clearly did didn't think he was suspicious in any way because nothing came of this. He wasn't considered a person of interest. And when he was able to get away with Linda's murder for nearly three years, he decided to do it again. On the 31st of July 1986, he came across 15-year-old Dawn Ashworth as she was walking along Ten Pound Lane. It was revealed that when Pitchfork first spotted Dawn, he decided that he was just going to walk behind her for a little while. He was just going to follow her. And then after a few minutes, he ran past her so that he was now ahead of her. And then after this, he turned around and he exposed himself to Dawn. Following this, he attacked Dawn. He raped her and then after he was done, just like he did with Linda, he strangled her to death. He then covered her body with a log and once again went back home and carried on with his life as normal. According to a documentary that I watched about this case, Colin basically said that the reason he killed the two girls was because they reacted badly to him flashing them. He said that he had flashed over a thousand women and girls over the years, but when he did it to Linda and Dawn, they reacted really badly. I think he means that they started to really panic, as I think any woman would. But because they reacted so badly, he decided in that moment that he had to kill them because they would probably go to the police otherwise and he would be arrested. In June of 1987, so less than a year after the murder of Dawn and just a couple of months before Colin was arrested, 
it was found that he actually tried to abduct another young girl. Her name was Liz and this happened in a town called Wigston in Leicestershire. Liz had been out with friends one night and afterwards she decided to walk home on her own. However, during her walk, she was offered a lift by a man who was driving by in a car. This man was Colin Pitchfork. Liz accepted this lift home and she got in the car. However, she very, very quickly regretted this decision. She got a really bad feeling about this guy and this bad feeling only got worse when he drove past the road that Liz lived down. He said that he would drop her home but he just drove straight past her house so clearly he did not have good intention and so Liz started shouting at Colin telling him to pull over and stop the car but he didn't. He just carried on driving and so Liz grabbed the wheel and she steered the car off the road and then she opened the door, got out of the vehicle and ran off. Liz didn't get in contact with the police about this at the time because she said that she just wanted to forget about it. She was very, very lucky to escape with her life that day. That was clearly Colin Pitchfork's attempt to rape and murder a third young girl. And it's actually believed that the only reason Liz escaped with her life that day was because she had kind of ruined the experience for Colin Pitchfork. With Pitchfork, his murders were all about control. He wanted to be the one in control at all times. He wanted that power over his victims. But Liz broke that power and that control when she grabbed the wheel and steered the car off the road. And so after this, it's believed that he was no longer interested in doing anything to her. So when she tried to get out of the car, he didn't really tried to stop her. He didn't try to put up a fight. In early 1988, at the end of his court proceedings, following his guilty plea, 28-year-old Colin Pitchfork was sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum of 30 years. However, in 2009, after spending about 20 years in prison, Pitchfork decided to appeal his sentence. He wanted to see if after all these years he could maybe get his sentence reduced and unbelievably his appeal was successful and two years was taken off his minimum sentence. So instead of his sentence being life imprisonment with a minimum of 30 years, it was now a minimum of 28 years. In April of 2016, Pitchfork applied for parole. He was put before the parole board and he was considered for early release. Apparently he had been a model prisoner. He was very well behaved behind bars. Apparently he had been working to further his education. He'd been learning how to transcribe printed music into braille for blind people. He claimed that he had reformed. He claimed that he was a completely different person and he was no longer a danger to society. But the parole board ultimately decided that he wouldn't be released just yet and instead he was moved to a category D prison, an open prison. However, a couple of years later, just last year actually, in September of 2021, 61-year-old Colin Pitchfork was granted release. He was released from prison after about 33 years. As I'm sure you can imagine, the families of Pitchfork's victims, the families of Linda Mann and Dawn Ashworth were so distraught and upset by this news. I cannot even begin to comprehend just how angry this must have made them feel. It's just terrifying, isn't it? The fact that a man who has a history of sexual assault and indecent exposure and who has committed two brutal murders of two children can be released from prison eventually. I just think it's absolutely insane. But anyway, he was released in September of 2021. He started staying in a bail hostel. However, it was not long at all until he was back behind bars. Just two months after his release in November of 2021, Colin Pitchfork was recalled back to prison for breaching his release conditions. Apparently he was seen on a number of occasions approaching young women whilst he was out walking and so he was apprehended and sent back to prison which I believe is where he still is right now. There really haven't been many updates about Colin Pitchfork since he went back to prison. According to a BBC News article which was published earlier this month, details of 
pitchforks next parole hearing have still not been released the parole hearing which i think will determine what happens with him next whether he will go back to an open prison or a normal prison whether he will ever be considered for release again so that is the current situation and i will of course keep you guys updated on that when we have some more information but let's hope for the families of his victims and just for the safety of other young women that he is now kept behind bars for the rest of his life he's been released and he broke the terms of his release he's proved that he has not changed so why should he be given another opportunity to be free he shouldn't in my opinion anyway but that is it for this case that is the case of linda mann and dawn ashworth as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on this case in the comments i would love to hear what you guys think also let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel again you can let me know in the comments or alternatively i do have a case request form linked in the description box of this video thank you all so so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and i will see you again next week for another mystery with molly